Здраво и добре дойдохте во Creative Talks. Верувам дека веќе добро знаете кај целото новија наше дружање да станеме сите малку по-креативни и по-инспирирани, а никогаш инспирацијата се наоѓа баш на оние најнеочекувани и нетипични места. А, нашата денешна гостинка не дава една малку поинаква перспектива на креативността, доаѓајќи од работ на позиција која што не е на класично креативно работно место. А, таа во моментов работи во Airbus, а ако ви кажам дека дел од незината специализација е работа на вселенски летала, сигурно сум дека сакате многу повеќе да знаете. So, Bianca, hello and welcome. Hi, Eva. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, for the beginning of Creative Talks, could you just tell us a bit more about yourself and your story? <laughs> yes, so um, I am uh, an Italian but London-based uh, rocket scientist. So uh, my whole story starts uh, when I was in Italy and I was a small child and I loved playing with cars in my dad's garage, basically, that was it. I was, I think, uh, seven years old when I really fell in love with everything that had to do with cars. Um, and also during our Sunday lunch, um, our ritual in Italy was to watch Formula One. And the Ferrari, as we know, is one of the mega brands of the Italian brands all over the world. So everything started from there, watching my my dad and uh, watching the Ferrari. And so basically, I wanted to become a Formula One engineer. Uh, And the funny thing is that no one in my family was an engineer at all. No one. No one even had high education and so on. So for me, it was this kind of major dream. I want to become a Formula One engineer. Um, and it, the more I would watch Formula One, the more I would uh, get interested into aerodynamics. So the aerodynamics is actually the dynamics of the airflow around objects. That could be a car, an aircraft, a uh, um, spacecraft, um, crossing the atmosphere, landers on other planets like Mars. And so I basically went on the um, on my university in Naples because I'm from Naples, the south of Italy, uh, the Federico II University. I went to check what kind of engineering I could possibly do so that I could become a, an expert in aerodynamics, and that was aerospace engineering. So I started my journey into aerospace engineering. Uh, I started again with Formula One um, because that was my passion since the very beginning. I founded the very first Formula student team at the University of Naples, and I was the team leader and the leader of the aerodynamics division. It, it didn't exist before I actually founded it with, with my friends at the time. Uh, and from there, because I was more and more, beca- more and more passionate and becoming expert into aerodynamics and fluid dynamics, uh, in 2013, it was in August summer, I was, I was looking for experiences that I could do abroad. So I didn't want to stay in Italy. I wanted to travel. I wanted to have a working experience, especially outside of the academia. I was relentless about this. And I got from one of my tutors at the time at university um, an email saying that company in Berlin was looking for um, such and such expertise for a NASA project. And it was a mission to Mars. And I was, wow, I was only 22 at the time. And uh, I was still studying my master for my master's degrees. And I, it was my very first internship position. I said, okay, I know someone, that's me. <laughs> and <laughs> I basically applied for this internship that it was in aerothermal fluid dynamics for a Martian lander, and which is Mars Insight. Which it, it, actually, it landed on Mars in 2018. So it's there now, uh, my very first project. And I applied there. I went, after two weeks, basically, I packed up all my life. I went and moved straight to Berlin, and there is where I started. I actually started my rocket science career because I wanted to work on cars, and then I started working straight on on a NASA project for Mars. And then I stayed in Berlin for five years. It was meant to be only six months, but then I, I, I was offered a job. So I was working in the morning and studying in the evening to finish my master's. And it's been an amazing experience. And after five years where I got many different skills from aerodynamics to thermal engineering, project, project management, and so on, uh, then I decided that I needed to, I want again, I wanted to move in 
for, to another country. I wanted to experience something different. So more than two years ago, I moved to London. Uh, and now I'm a product manager for Airbus Defence and Space. So I work now not anymore on science missions, but on telecommunication spacecraft. And uh, besides that, I'm also a STEM ambassador, which means I go and make, uh, I create workshops into school for kids. I embrace the empowering of youths, especially women, into STEM careers. So science, technology, engineering and mathematics, especially for space. Now I became into isolation, the co-author of a Space for Women show. So it's all dedicated to women that want to have a career in space. Uh, I'm a public speaker and all of uh, um, social influencers, so all of the, the things that you can possibly think of, any time I can speak about space and how it can fit into everyone's life, you know, the, the more I, I, I embrace these moments like this one. I'm really happy that we have the opportunity to talk about it at Creative Talks. Um, so, so far we've spoken with photographers, designers, gamers, but these are all professions that are kind of directly connected to creativity. Uh, what about rocket science? How do you find creativity in your line of work? Um, so it seems, um, as you said, for the, let's say for, for the, the public, it seems that rocket science or engineering doesn't have much creativity. Actually, it, it does. And uh, especially when you work in innovation. So when we think about technology, innovation, and especially missions, they really have to break any kind of boundaries of what has been known so far, like space travels. You have to be very, very creative. Now, being creative in rocket science actually means to look at, to find the solution to a problem, but looking at it from a different angle, a bit like photographers do. So what makes a, a, what makes a good photography? Actually, I started um, getting even more and more into my creativity flow. When I started reading this book, which is called The, Crea the Psychology of Creativity and Innovation. And it was actually linking innovation, so these eureka moments, these very visionary ideas that you can have in technology, with art, with poetry, with sculpture, with all of other the other uh, different subjects where you see creativity being like the core subject. And actually, there is no much difference. The way here photography is looking at an object, a face, and is making it an epic picture is the way he's looking at it for me it's the same when i have a problem that i have to solve and clearly i have to stay within the boundary of physics because this, those are the laws i have to look at it from a different angle so if for instance um for telecommunication spacecraft the most renowned uh, material that is being used is aluminium it means that if i want to get innovative I have to start looking uh, even at the smallest detail that can change that material and looking at different materials. So it's not that big, big, uh, crazy idea, but it's really looking into the details and how I can change those details so that there could be a domino effect. If I change this material, it means that it can be cheaper, it can be lighter, it means that I can change the design of the propulsion rather than the structure. So it's all connected. So this is how, within the boundary of science, I can be creative. Uh, what does your pre uh, creative process look like? Do you have some kind of method that helps you to start working? Um, I don't have a very specific creative uh flow um to be honest well, uh, the, the creativity comes from what really excites me and uh, especially it comes from um from curiosity so again uh being this an engineer and a scientist i have to be very well prepared with what the market wants because if i have to innovate i have to do something or I have to look at a solution that was never implemented before. So this could be probably my logic behind the creativity. I have to be aware of what's out there, what's been done, what's the competitors, what the market wants, what the audience and the end users want. And then I have to take all of these on board and then I have to make my own assumptions. So this is probably the process that I'm using logically. But then when I looked at all of those, everything is just coming naturally, let's say. It's coming from that 
some news probably that some some design or something that i've seen that sparked my interest so i start digging into it i start understanding how this could possibly fit into my project so that it becomes innovative so this is the thought process behind um you have a bit of a different perspective in creativity and also in testing the things when you want to be creative so uh, how did you gain confidence in your creative process? How did you make sure that, okay, we're going to try this and this is the exact approach that you need to take in any occasion? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, it is something that it comes with experience. Mm -hmm. uh, because now I've been in this industry for, for 10 years and clearly the way now I think a product or a project is going to work is way more confident than when I was when I was younger uh, because I didn't have all those insights uh, and especially uh, in my job I need to have hands-on experience meaning I really had to be there doing the test doing the qualification seeing the, the, the object in my hands how it works how it feels how it breaks how am I going to integrate these pieces together I had to go through different failures this was the key different trials and failures as science it is and also life in overall i had to go through these different steps so now all these failures and different trials are adding up to my confidence where i'm like okay this is actually the product that is going to work because it doesn't have all of those different items that made it fail for me in the past and also for all the other ones that tried it before so actually, yeah, failures make me feel more confident into my creative process. <laughs> okay, uh, so I actually the next question is related to failures as a normal part of growing. Uh, can you remember when was the last time that you failed at your job doing something? And what did you do to overcome that mistake? What did you do to change it? Uh, so um, I think that there is something I fail at every day. <laughs> I'm sure I do, you know, from that missed email, from, you know, overlooking an issue that then it became a big issue. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on a project uh, or, or mainly a product, uh, which is in qualification. And uh, I, I don't want to look at it as a failure because it's a collective issue, unfortunately. And for instance, the, 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 the biggest problem is because I haven't, I've inherited this project from previous years from previous project managers, previous teams. So I've inherited already something that wasn't mine, so I had to make it work. And the failure stays in the fact that I probably had overlooked this kind of project. I thought it was easier to handle because it was definitely much easier than what I had done in the past. And that was probably something that hit me in the back because the whole testing and the delays now, especially with the crisis that nobody could you know, even imagine, um, made it longer and more painful than what actually was. Uh, so I had to acknowledge the difficulties that we were having, that we, we all were inheriting so far, and I could just make adjustments. I could justify why those problems were there, why we were kind of failing at delivering on time for more than justifiable reasons and i could just keep my team and myself motivated and keep going so the key was the key it is even now when you think that you were failing at something at least for me you still find what justifies that failure and you keep going you never quit you keep going <laughs> until you actually deliver and it's no more a failure awesome um, so you're a public speaker, a motivator for a lot of young girls, but there's this one thing about uh, self-doubt. How do you deal with that? How do you gain your self-confidence? In a, I'm not going to touch on the point that you're working in an industry that there are not a lot of women and they're not respected as much as, as, much as they should be. But just when you're thinking about your ideas, how do you deal with those thoughts? Am I good enough? Is this good enough? Do you have any kind of advice about that? Um, yeah, I do. And, uh, so, um, I I'm going to give you this, um, this little story. So when I moved to London and I started my job in, um, at Airbus Defense in Space as a product manager, I was, uh, I was younger than 30. 
And uh, during the second week of my starting the job, uh, my line manager at the, at the time, he asked me, he, he threw me straight into the affairs of the job. So he said, okay, now we have this product review with all the stakeholders from France here and there, and you're going to be there. I said, sure. Why not? <laughs> and uh, so basically, I was the youngest and the only female in the boardroom of Airbus Defense and Space with 40 men that were definitely older than me, uh, which was great. And at the same time, I was like, where are all the others? And that moment, in that moment, I didn't feel frightened. I felt very proud because I said, if I'm here, and irrespective of my gender, because I'm young, so definitely, you know, being young into such a, uh, a, an important place could feel as frightening. I was very proud. And I said, if I'm here and if they chose me to be here, it means that my voice is valid. It means that my experience is valid. So I had to work on being valid myself. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be there. Why should I be there? And this is what I tell myself every day, because even before coming here, I was questioning, what am I supposed to say now about creativity when actually I'm not, you know, as uh, rocket science, science is not seen as creative. I was self-doubting myself. But then I said, actually, I have loads of things to say. So it's these kind of voices that are do actually do you actually have value? And then I'm thinking about all my life that I've lived so far. I'm like, yeah, you definitely have. <laughs> this is my inner voices always overcoming the issue. I definitely agree that you have a reason to be here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's get back to the ideas in your workplace. How do you decide? How do you decide if an idea is a good idea? Uh, so an idea is a good idea when actually is meeting the needs of an end user. Uh, and this is for everything. Uh, again, we are living, especially now, we are living in a virtual world where your audience is, is virtual. Your socials are becoming your validate, what validates your idea or your project. So as much as I can, um, I can love what I, the idea I came up, or that art that I'm creating, if I don't have validation from the public, and if that is not solving an issue that my niche community uh, has, then my idea is not good. It means it's okay on the paper, but it's not solving any problem, and it's not going to be used for any good reason. So if there are these two points, meeting the needs of my and customer or user and solving a problem, then for me, there are two main reasons why it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a group of close people that you test ideas on? Uh, yeah, so especially in my job, we have a team. So it's as much as I can come up with a visionary idea, but it's always a teamwork. So there is always a briefing before, so a brainstorming where we have to really understand and trade off different designs, different visions that we have and put them together. So before we actually come out and say and pitch to the sponsors, okay, this is actually what's going to work for your next space product and this is what you should pay for. We all work together months in advance, sometimes years. Uh, I remember that something that I am, I am supposed to develop and qualify this year was for last year. So there is a long process where you have to confront yourself with all the different people. And especially you need to be judged for what you are thinking about. You need the experts to come in and say, this won't work for this, this is not working for this reason. They have to peer your project apart so that you understand, okay, I have to come up with another idea. So there is a lot of process behind to the point where you say, okay, now this is great. This is going to meet the needs. It's going to have the validation from the customers. We are getting the budget. We go for it. Uh, what happens when you reach a creative block, when you just don't have a clue what to do next? Do you have any kind of method how to deal with that? Uh, I have to take a break and isolate myself which this moment is great, you know, it's, it's the isolation, this, this, this period has been probably the moment where I created the most, um, because I need to be on my own and think, especially walk in nature. This is what I need the most. 
And this is where uh, I'm clearing my head of what I used to call uh, brain pollution from, you know, all this different clutter and chatter coming from our routines, from our colleagues, family, friends, all the things that you are kind of absorbing that they are not yours. And this is like the pipe is getting blocked with all of these things that don't belong to you. So I just need to go and stay on my own. Well, walk, going for a hike. Now the moment is difficult, so I use meditation a lot. This is even five minutes meditation a day can really improve, at least for me, uh, my subconscious creative mind. Definitely. You didn't start baking during the coronavirus no, lockdown? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> okay. No, there was, it was uh, not cooking, but um, throughout my, my life, actually, I realized that You know, but let's say I was inspired by something else that will make me creative. Mm -hmm. and, and also the more you create, the more actually you create, because it's like you are on this engine that is just going on and on and on. Um, is there anything about creativity that you thought and you were very wrong about? I thought that I wasn't creative. Uh, because uh, I thought I wasn't because, you know, I was logically an engineer. So I would speak mathematics and physics and all the laws of physics. So I thought wrongly myself that there was no creativity because creativity is for artists. Uh, and that was very wrong because uh, we are all creative in our own ways. And uh, it is a muscle that you need to train and creativity is all around us. So that was, I was very wrong on myself, actually. Uh, what about the outside? Did you get any good advice about creativity or what was the best advice on creativity that you have ever gotten? Um, I never really received advices, but I've always seen uh, my mom. I've always, look, I've always looked at her being very, very creative because she has always been a makeup artist. So she didn't need to speak. The way she was actually changing people from one moment to the other one For me, it was like, wow, this is what you can do when you're actually creating something. And um, so it was never an advice. It was for me to, to look around and actually see how other people would get creative in their own ways. Um, and that was something that also made me think about how uh, we can express creativity in our own unique uh, identities. Mm -hmm. uh, so what if I ask you to be the one giving the advice? What, what is one thing that everyone should know about creativity from your perspective and from your experience? Um, this is something actually have, um, I'm supposed to give a lecture about at an international conference for women in space and engineering. Again, where you think that creativity is really much. Uh, what I've realized from my experience is that I was very less creative when I was trying to be someone I wasn't. When I was trying to speak, to act, to behave in a way that wasn't mine. And I've realized that the more I would, uh, and this is in these very small things from really the way we dress up, the way we talk, the way we move our hands, the more we are expressing our own inner nature, the more we create because that's our unique uh, fire. And the more we trying to fit into someone else's perspective, expectations, uh, boxes, especially in engineering, when there is a kind of uh, very um, common way of behaving, of uh, dressing up, you know, it is a very plain uh, corporate uh, dynamic, corporate culture. I realized I don't care. I am myself. I want to dress up and talk and speak and be loud the way I want. And the more I was doing that, the more my ideas were visionary. So you can be creative only if you are not violating your own nature. That's it. And that is also a good way, I think, to beat the stereotype in your industry. Just prove that you can be both, like be a great pretty girl and do amazing stuff. Because I, I don't understand how it can be a correlation that it doesn't work. If you look good and if you're dressed up, you cannot be a rock and scientist. I mean. Exactly. But, uh, but also if, if you think, so uh, I was hired for being a disruptive innovator. 
And this is exactly what I was telling managers and all, all the other people around me, because the way I work is a very different way from what corporate culture uh, has. Because, you know, it's the nine to five job behind the screen. You're always there. For me, instead, I was always traveling. I was finding actual inspiration during my business travels, talking to people, networking, socializing, creative, creating communities around me that would support uh, with suppliers, with those clients, so that I knew what actually they needed. They were not really used to this. And I told my manager, if you want a disruptive innovator, be sure that that person will have a disruptive character because no one is going to be innovative and visionary by being exactly as you've been so far so it's they go together and you see you have creativity in everything you do i don't know how you doubted yourself but please don't anymore <laughs> uh, just for the end i would like to ask you uh, what was the feeling when you decide when you discovered that you're going to work for nasa on a mission to mars i, I just want to no, how, how did you deal with everything? I mean, it's a it's huge news. Oh, wow. That's, so I can tell you, first of all, that when I saw the mission landing on Mars, I cried. That was, that was like, because I said, even if my job, even if my life is done today, I know that something of myself is on another planet. And then when I applied for the job, probably it was because I was so young and inexperienced, so I wasn't overthinking. So I said, I'm going to try, you know, yeah. I have nothing to lose. And then when I actually got it. I was so excited that I, I didn't, I just wanted to be there. I didn't have, I didn't really think of the consequences. And it was after the six months of my internship when I actually realized you've been working for NASA, you've been doing this. It's where I actually had a kind of breaking point because I was working myself up so much that there was a point where I had a kind of burnout psychologically because I said, wow, this has been a lot. <laughs> to, to, it was a big responsibility for me to be my first job, my first everything, my first moving abroad from home. Um, so it didn't come immediately, it came later and it was quite hard. <laughs> but then when I saw the lender, I was like, yeah, you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. I mean, I feel special just talking to you. So <laughs> no, don't, don't. No, there are many other people, and uh, you know that that was the that was also the beautiful thing, being with a team of people from all over the world. Because I was working in Germany, then the other ones were working actually at NASA in the States. Some others were working from France, from Italy. So it was a collective. But as an individual, I felt so much responsibility because I was so young and inexperienced that everything came after. And I was even thinking like, what if I made a mistake and now everything is going to fail? <laughs> you know, imagine. <laughs> but then, yeah, it was, it was a psychological heavy process. Uh, how did you deal with the stress in those situations? Or just go with it and that's it? <laughs> I think... Um, I always uh, saw stress, okay, probably now Now that I'm getting a bit older, <laughs> let's say, uh, I'm refusing to be so much, so, so stressed about things uh, because then I get anxious and that's no good. Um, but stress for me was key, was necessary because the more... It, kind of controlled stress, like when your dopamine level are right about where you get things done. Because if I'm under stress, it means that I'm too relaxed and I'm not getting things done. So I have to be always kind of on edge to make things work. So the stress actually was working in my favor. The, the more I was stressed, the more I would do things. Mm -hmm. But then on the long run, it's not very sustainable because again, you can incur into burn out and then everything that you've achieved so far goes on a hold because you just can't do anymore. So now I feel that the more uh, I need to say no to many things and the less I do actually, the more I'm creating because I'm giving space to what I actually want to do. Great. Um, so these were all my questions. If there's anything that you would like to add um, I would like to say that uh, as I was wrong about creativity, because I thought I wasn't creative, um, I want to say that everyone is creative. 
really. Creativity is in is inside everyone. It's all around us. It's, it's just a matter of how you look at things. And you may think that the way you look at something isn't that creative or isn't that special because you are not finding validation from a lot of other people. But there is that niche out there. There is that your tribe. There is the tribe where actually you feel understood. And this is what happened to me since I was a child. I was very different from many because I was from the South. I was a girl. I wasn't very girly at the time. I wanted to study engineering. I wanted to do all the things that no one had ever done as a woman and I felt very misunderstood and I thought okay I'm just crazy but actually the more I was going towards what I wanted to be the more I was getting people around me now my support community my friends my colleagues who are pretty much like me and they can understand my thought process they can understand where my creativity is coming from and they can support you so if you think that what you are doing or who you are is weird and crazy that's awesome because it means that you will find your crazy tribe and they will be the ones helping you validating those concepts that you think are not actually valid i think that i couldn't have done a better wrap up myself <laughs> so thank you so much for your time and thank you for the answers for the advice for the motivation i hope that we get a chance to speak again soon i hope so thank you again for having me it's been great